sloping. Um, there we go. Otherwise, I'll pour my drink all over me, and that'll be a good start. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, not so warm outside, warm in here. Um, the great and the good of publishing. Um, fortunately, I'm not great or good, um, but um, I am going to talk to you today about when science met fiction. Um, this is digital publishing um, in the age of convergence. Now, this is not endorsed by Sage. This is my own thoughts. I have to say that because my boss is sitting in the corner over there. I think my boss's boss is here as well. Hopefully, I'll have a job at the end of the day. This is what we're going to cover um, during the next 25 minutes or so. If I do my stopwatch now, um, then I won't run over. Front matter, just the introductions. Um, then we're talking about thinkers, uh, key thinkers uh, in science fiction and futurists, and what they say about uh, publishing, and what we could, what we can expect um, in the future. And I've kind of broken these down towards the end into the age of flux, kind of the time we're in now, the age of reason, uh, the age of convergence, and then wrapping up with some future notes at the end. Now. I did wonder when, when Anthony asked me to do, um, come and do this talk, um, you just have to talk about the future of ebooks. So I was like, mm, well, that, that's kind of a, a big subject. Um, where do I even begin? How on earth am I going to actually talk about this? It seems to change every day, every week. Um, there's a new acronym to know, uh, there's something that goes wrong with Core Source. Um, there's the, all these kind of things. That's a learning curve for every day. But, I, I kind of I sat there thinking one day, and I was I was looking at my bookshelf, and I was thinking, well, maybe maybe I can go outside of Earth, and and, and see where we can go with ebooks um, in the future through looking at science fiction. I have one thousand nine hundred and seventeen print books. Um, I my job is uh, is a digital sales manager. I sell ebooks for a living. I love print though. Um, I have lots of books. Um, I have lots of bookshelves. Um, it's a necessity. I have lots of books piled on the floor. Um, this talk is based on just books that I had on my bookshelf. Um, I, I kind of specified that as a restriction because you could go on, on and on and on. Um, so we were looking to the kind of stars to, to see what kind of would happen in the future. And the great thing about this is, is this speculative fiction. Um, whatever I say today, um, who knows what's going to happen in the future? And by the time it all happens, I'll probably be gone. So you can't actually complain about it. And it's a journey through the mists of time and space. Um, we're going to go through a lot of different authors, a lot of futurists, a lot of uh, seers, as, as Anthony was mentioning there. Um, that's Mad Men, by the way, not James Bond, as someone said at, at my uh, desk the other day. Um, and, and just see what they had, had thoughts about um, what they thought was going to be happening to the wider kind of publishing arena, to education, to books in general. Basically, I'm just going to be looking at what they said in the past to kind of try and tell you what's going to happen in the future. Now, there is a wide array of actual authors um, and futurists that, that I had found on my um, bookshelves. These are all authors that I've loved, all books that I've loved over the, over the last few years. Um, most of these are actually included in the talk today. Um, some I couldn't actually include but in, in a major way, but just, just to touch on, on how, how long this could actually go on. It could go on for hours. I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't want that. But, um, Ursula Le Guin in the 1960s uh, invented something called the Ansible. Um, the Ansible was, uh, was carried on in, in things like An Ender's Game, Orson Scott Card, um, the forerunner of email, just as an aside. So uh, Ursula Le Guin um, and Robert A. Heinlein um, in his 1961 book, Stranger in a Strange Land, invented the screensaver. Useful information next time you're in a pub quiz. So basically, to talk about the future, we need first to go back to the 1960s. For me, a, a lot rests upon Jorge Luis Borges. Um, his short fiction uh, can be, basically covers everything, everything you can possibly want to know in the world ever. Um, one of his major stories, though, was The Library of Babel, um, which was released in 1962 in English. It was originally written in Buenos Aires in 1944. 
Library of Babel um, is something that, that I find fascinating in terms of, of where we're actually moving in the publishing industry. Um, the library was coined as a, as a universal library. It had all the books in it, and all the books about all the books, and all the books about all those books, and all those books. Um, infinite number of books. And that's where, eventually, we are heading, I feel, anyway. Um, and we will touch on um, Rogers all the way through the talk. Um, this is a quote from him. When, when it was proclaimed that the library contained all books, the first impression was one of extravagant happiness. I realise I can read that on the floor now. Um, so it's a happy place. This is a good thing we're, we're heading towards. We're, we're kind of cautious about um, making everything available. I, I'm particularly thinking about the Google project, um, which caused waves so uh, a few years back. Um, but it's a good thing for society that we're moving in that direction. Isaac Asimov, mainly included because he has fantastic sideburns. Um, I'd never actually seen a picture of Isaac Asimov, and when I saw this, I was like, I have to have him in. Um, researching into, uh, into some of his works, though, um, Isaac Asimov wrote in every single one, of, apart from one, of the Dewey Decimal um, subject categories. He wrote over 500 books. He was a smart guy. I wish he was here. Um, but things like Foundation and iRobot, which was made into a movie with Will Smith, don't watch it. Um, got his name in science fiction, but he was also a futurist as well. Um, in 1976, he said, I've written about the world or a global village tied together electronically with e every citizen able to communicate instantly with every other. I think this has merit. I think it has merit too. This is the world we live in, but this is, this is him talking 30, 40 years ago. I'm not sure he's, in, he's very happy about being included in this speech. <laughs> Isaac's talking to us from beyond. Um, but he still had a good idea. Um, yes, yeah, so he's, he's foreseeing the internet here. <laughs> What's going on? If he walks in, I'm walking out that way. <laughs> Just, uh, we'll, we'll kind of quickly go through Isaac. Um, he also said that once we have uh, computer outlets in every home hooked up to enormous libraries, where anyone can ask a question and be given answers um, and be given reference materials and be something that they're interested in knowing, then everyone would enjoy learning. This is a theme that, that crops up again and again with uh, the authors and, and futurists that I've been uh, kind of studying over the last few weeks. Um, nowadays, when people, what people call learning is forced on you and everyone is forced to learn the same time, at the same day, at the same speed in class. And Isaac says, everyone is different. And it's so true. You can remember being in class and... and, and having to have 40 other people in the class, it's impossible to keep at the right pace um, as part of your education at that way. It's, it's the only way we can do it, probably, but in the future, um, we're looking at ways, or there will be ways of, of learning and assessing on an individual basis. Moving on along the alphabet to Arthur C. Clarke. Um, Arthur C. Clarke um, said, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I don't pretend to have all the answers either. But those questions are worth talking about. It's worth discussing and worth uh, um, doing events like this and talking about science fiction when, when you're at an academic uh, conference. He did, however, write a book called The Sentinel, um, which was made into uh, the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, in 1968. Um, he presaged the, the iPad, the iPad which he called the Newspad, um, harking back to the, the Guardian in our, in our last speech, um, with the ship's information circuit and the scan the latest reports from Earth. One by one, he would conjure up, conjure. I like that. If, every time I look at my iPad now, I'm going to conjure up things, um, conjure up my email, um, conjure up the world's major electronic papers. He was um, a futurist at the time. He was excited about what the possibilities <coughs> held in the future. Now, Ray Kurzweil um, is, to me, the 86% man. Ray Kurzweil was the inventor of text-to-speech in the 1970s, um, and is currently director of um, Google, engineering at Google. Um, I saw him speak at Tools of Change a couple of years ago. I was absolutely baffled. The man is so intelligent, you can hardly understand him. Um, <laughs> unlike myself. Um, <laughs> he's the 86% man because 
he has written a series of books um, which have a series of uh, predictions in them over the last, ooh, I think he started in 1990 with, with kind of some of his major publications. 86% um, of the predictions he's made have come true, um, which is quite staggering, um, and no wonder he's got a very well-paid job at Google. Some of the things that he suggested, this is 1990 predicting 2010. The classroom is dominated by computers, intelligent courseware that can tailor itself to each student by recognizing their strengths and weaknesses. Media technology allows students to manipulate and interact with virtual depictions of their systems and personalities they are studying. Sounds fantastic. I know we're not quite there probably in 2010, but it's certainly on the way. 1999, he came back with the age of spiritual machines. Um, computers are embedded everywhere in the environment. People experience 3D virtual reality through glasses and contact lenses. Remind you of anyone of kind of augmented reality? Google Glasses that were launched this year. People communicate with their computers via two-way speech and gestures. Anyone's got an iPhone, they can um, they all know about Siri, you can ask a question, and strangely, it will, it will tell you the answer. Um, and gestures, uh, you can only think of things like the, um, the PlayStation and, and Xbox, where where you can control um, what's happening on the screen by just moving your hands. Thin, lightweight, handheld displays with very high resolutions are the preferred means of viewing documents. That's already happened. Um, most learning is accomplished through intelligent, adaptive courseware presented by computer-simulated teachers. I don't know what that says about the, the teaching um, profession in, in 10 years' time. There won't be any teachers. There will just be a computer screen in front of you um, or a hologram. Uh, maybe it's good. Um, Maybe it's slightly worrying, as I say, for the teachers, um, as it was for journalism in, in, in the last... Nobody's going to have a job at the end of this day. <laughs> Quickly again, uh, 1999 uh, going into 2029, virtual reality delivered by computer implants in your eyes and ears. Looking forward to that. Um, computer implants designed for direct connection to the brain are capable of augmenting natural senses and of enhancing higher brain functions like memory, learning speed, and overall intelligence. So basically, you don't have to worry about anything. You can just put a chip in your head. Um, and computers are now capable of learning, creating new knowledge. It's slightly worrying. And 2099, Ketsvar um, uh, says, natural human thinking possesses no advantages over computer minds. He's talking about the singularity here, the complete merge between humans and machines. Um, there's, and the, the worrying thing was the last comment there, which was, Computer viruses are a major threat since most intelligent beings are software-based. Things to look forward to. <laughs> now, Alvin Toffler, who, apart from having a great name, um, wrote a book in the 70s called Future Shock, um, worrying about what was going to happen in the future. But in 1990, I believe, he, talked, he wrote another book called The Power Shift. Um, he returned to the idea of uh, Sir Francis Bacon, which is knowledge is power, um, and was this is just picking out one of these quotes in, in terms of it means that we are creating new networks of knowledge, linking concepts to one another in startling ways. Basically, uh, uh, he's talking about creating that library of Babel that we were talking about earlier. Um, the data is networked together um, so that we actually have valuable information from all over. Another futurist, um, Nicholas Negroponte, um, is a professor at MIT. Um, in the early 80s, he was talking about the convergence, um, the media convergence in particular, um, and how various strands of the media would focus in together, uh, merge together, so that they were actually delivered kind of seamlessly uh, by, by one, um, one route. So you'd get all your information, all your entertainment um, in a single stream. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine have it, actually having a device where you could actually check the weather and um, well, watch a movie? Um, listen to music, do work, read, learn, all in one device. It's, it sounds amazing. Um, I don't know if anyone's got one of those. <laughs> Next up was Neil Stevenson, uh, who apart from looking um, quite like someone you wouldn't want to meet, because um, he is actually shaving his head with a sword, um, has done a lot to, to amazing things in, in his books about uh, talking about where we will be in the future. Um, the main thing that he, he is what we're kind of renowned for is the, the metaverse. Um, this was something he coined in his book in 1992, I think, uh, which was Snow Crash. Um, the metaverse 
is a precursor to, to what people are calling the semantic web or web 3.0. Um, it's a merging of that virtual and physical uh, space. So you can actually um, live in reality and in virtual reality as well. Um, again, this is augmented reality, this is Google Vision or Google Glasses. Um, one day we'll be living separate lives. Uh, we'll have an avatar in, in, in virtual reality where we can actually go meet people and, and actually gain information. The other thing about the, the metaverse is it, that it actually generates information through the data, through those networks, um, and it can actually harvest that data and create information itself. Carl Wolfram here saying that the, where the computer, this is how he describes the semantic web, where the computer is generating new information. The other point that um, Neil Stevenson makes is in his other book, the, uh, the, one of his other books, the, the Diamond Age, which is um, a young lady's Victorian illustrated primer. Um, in order to raise a generation of children who can reach their full potential, we must find a way to make their lives interesting. The illustrated primer was um, a book that a child had from day one, and it actually grew up with them. It became a mentor, a teacher, a friend, basically. Um, and it learned to assess the kind of learning capacity of that person um, as they were going. So it's, it's an interesting uh, kind of idea from Stevenson and, and one that I think we're, we're moving towards, not necessarily um, from day one, but it's, it's thinking about assessment, thinking about blended learning and, and multimedia in terms of actually teaching and, and uh, our kids in the future. Now, finally, out of the um, various authors, I, I had to mention Douglas Adams. This is Douglas Adams on his 42nd birthday. Everyone on their 42nd birthday should be able to play um, guitar with Pink Floyd. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> he, of course, wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, and as part of the guide, he said, the guide is definitive. Reality is frequently inaccurate. Um, I, I actually spent too much time watching things uh, about Douglas Adams um, on YouTube. He does uh, various... Um, uh, talks. Uh, he does a very, very fantastic talk about uh, Madagascar, if you want to watch that. It's an hour and a half long. It's on YouTube. It's free. Um, but he is rather fascinating, but he did draw me away from actually doing any work. Um, but he did say this, um, and, and this kind of gives hope to print uh, in the future. Generally, old media don't die. They just have to grow old gracefully. Guess what? We still have stonemasons. They haven't been a, a primary purveyors of the written word for a while now, of course, but they still have a role because you wouldn't want to have a TV screen on your headstone. And it's quite true, really. Um, things don't necessarily die. Print won't die. It may be displaced somewhat, but it'll still be around. People will still like print. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and say the digital world is going to take over. And unless there's no trees, um, I think there will always be print. Um, it will just be um, a relationship with, with, with digital. It will be complementing each other. So, the ages. This is the age of flux. Now, I could have probably done 15 slides like this, or a huge list of 5,000 things. These are the things that have, um, I just picked out that are pressurizing uh, the publishing industry at the moment. Um, things like piracy, the used book industry. Um, we're, we're at Sage um, experiencing problems with through the used book industry, like um, more so than, uh, say, e-books cannibalizing print sales. We're, we're seeing the print sales um, through second-hand markets uh, cannibalizing sales. It's more of a pressure than, than anything at the moment. Price, uh, how to work out price, how to work out price in the digital arena especially, when there's so many different models, so many different vendors, um, how to actually get that price delivered to the end customer in a, in a seamless way. Amazon, I'm just gonna put Amazon there because I just feel like uh, uh, Amazon are a good thing and a bad thing, um, and they can, they, basically they just make life complicated, but they're, uh, they're a necessary I won't say e yeah, I will say evil. Um, and things like open, uh, the, 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 the move towards um, uh, MOOCs, it, it's creating pressure mainly because we don't know where that's going to actually lead. What do we do about MOOCs? How do we complement them? How do we work with them uh, to make learning better, to improve education? 
the digital world is, is, is quite new still. I, I know we, we, we do talk about certain mature markets. The library market's a bit more mature for e-books than, than the retail market, especially for an academic book, especially for Sage, anyway. Um, but it is a time of flux. It's a nascent market. I'm hoping that that time of flux will gradually transition into an age of reason. There seems to be a lot of things going on now, um, and I'd just like it to be simplified. I, I, I hope sanity will prevail. Um, there's a lot of different uh, formats, there's a lot of different ways, of models, prices. Um, I'm hoping that in the next few years that things actually do calm down and become a bit more standardized. Um, I love the word standards. Um, I'm hoping standards will be created. I also hope the standards will be created and they will be adhered to. Um, standing here as an ebook manager, and the one thing I would really, really desperately like to see is standardization of sales data. And the sales data you get from vendors uh, around the world. So you actually get it in the same format. It would be just so nice. Um, I'm hoping that one day, I know people are working on, on that at BIC, Isaac's back. Um, at BIC to, to actually make these kind of things happen, but it's, it's putting pressure on the vendors to actually implement those, because what's the point of standards if we don't actually standardize and actually use them? Things like blended learning, um, classroom learning, uh, tagged with, with, with online learning, will become prevalent. The idea of, of the kind of illustrated primer, so you can actually assess um, the students outside of the classroom. Mixed media um, data. Data will be the, the language of the future, um, the language of publishing, the language of most actual um, media enterprises. And things like institutional sales will become prevalent, um, mainly because students will just demand it. They'll expect, as they're paying huge fees for, for their courses, that their books and content will be free. Now, convergence. Out of this pre-medial soup will come um, an age of convergence. And this will affect selling, creating, pricing models, devices, and formats. I very much hope that formats will be um, standardized so that hopefully something like EPUB 3, 5, something like that will actually be the standard that everyone adheres to. Um, I wish Amazon would, would uh, adhere to it in, in, uh, in a way that doesn't actually ring fence their content or try to ring fence their content. Devices. Devices um, will become much more converged. Uh, the, the, the emergence of, of the iPad or the tablet device uh, has really caused a revolution in the market uh, in recent years. It will only continue. It will grow. It, the power of the actual tablet will improve. The, I don't find it particularly uh, good to work with, but to actually consume content, to actually consume information that is a fantastic tool. Selling will change. Um, I, I see in the future that there'll be a, a content hub where publishers um, and content providers and authors will push content to the actual centralized hub. Distributors will then work with the hub to push that out towards the purchasers or consumers. Publishers will need to stay relevant or still will have to try and stay relevant through improving their value um, and creating powerful and, and engaging content. It is all about the content. I don't want to say content is king, but it is true. That's what we have. We're good at making and creating and drawing in and attracting content. Um, and we just need to push it out to the consumer in the most appropriate way that they actually want. And again, pricing and models. Um, I see the future being usage, um, which may be a little bit scary, subscription and, and usage based on the number of pages actually used. Because um, a lot of publishers actually benefit from wastage, um, which is kind of frightening uh, in, in the fact that libraries, we, we hope that libraries buy all our books. We don't mind so much that they don't use them. Um, that will be a thing of the past with things like patron-driven access. The future will also be sad. It will be about statistics. It will be about analytics. And it will be about data. It will be about looking at Excel spreadsheets 10, 12 hours a day, which is fun. The future is bright. 
there is a certain terrorism uh, of, of short-termism as well. In terms of um, publishers looking for the quick fix, um, it's not that easy. Short-term solutions to fundamental issues um, are not going to help in the long run. I'm advocating for much more research and development. You look at the, the pharmaceutical industry, it does a huge amount of um, uh, investment in research and development because that is the way things are going. That's how they make their money. It's in the future. Um, advocating for research and development for publishing as well on a, a much higher level. I know we all do it, but doing it in much more detail and listening to the customer. And there will just be a society ch shift in the fact that um, ownership will move towards access. Um, access being rental, l um, licensing, pay-per-view, things like that, rather than ownership. It's, always, it's already in that, in that sphere now. Um, when you buy an e-book, you don't own it, you license it. Um, it may seem that you own it, but you don't. And that will uh, involve a change in copyright. I'm not going to talk about copyright, because copyright is, uh, by nature, incredibly dull. Um, but we'll need to have a copyright that is fit for purpose. Um, something that is positive and access right. Instead of saying what you can't do with the content, say what you can do. Adhering to all these kind of uh, suggestions would, would move us through the age of flux, through the age of reason to the age of convergence. Um, so we'll go through from the dissonance of the kind of age of flux era and the fear and caution that that, that creates um, to adapting and to actually surviving and then living uh, kind of in harmony with, with what we have. Now the far future, I'm going to speed up. Um, Personalised learning, as we spoke of before, actually shaped by the consumer so that actually the publisher is listening and creating content for the consumer. Subscription, usage-based, um, device agnostic uh, content, useful, so it's not hobbled by DRM. Intelligent recommendation engines. If you look on Amazon, um, the, the things that uh, they kind of recommend to you, the things people have also bought, it's not terribly useful at the moment, but it will be in the future. Quickly, um, advanced distributed learning. This is as close as I found on the internet and in, in, in the kind of research I did to what a very good example of, of research into learning capabilities in the future. Um, advanced distributed learning has been created by the US um, Department of Defense, who also brought us the internet and the B2 stealth bomber, so they're good at futuristic things. Um, this is basically um, the illustrated primer. This is what's going to happen in the future, they are thinking. Um, personalized learning um, on any device that you want with access anywhere you are. Did everyone finish reading that one? Um, and the future publisher, based on strategic alliances, again, research and development, data-driven, multi-content streams, not just print, not just text, but video, audio, everything. Um, Customer-focused, you have to listen to our customers in order to stay relevant. Future market, ownership, again, replaced by access, convergence in the media, single content hubs, and hopefully improved learning incomes, outcomes, sorry. You might have heard that phrase before, the information superhighways in the 1990s term, but eventually we're actually gonna get there. Um, we're not quite there now, but we're gonna have information in the future that we can, everyone has access to. And future partners, famous brands, like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Starbucks. Starbucks may be a, a strange one, but, and, and Microsoft. Notice here that all famous brands do not have a D in them. If you have a company with a D in it, change it now, and you're <laughs> going to be fine for the future. So Wiley, Blackwell, you're, you're set, OUP. Mm. Bookshops are going to be disappearing. I see the coffee shop as the place where people will go for content, um, for community, that community spirit where they can download their content wherever they uh, go and get a cup of coffee and have their book clubs and it actually be in a focus point because there basically is a coffee shop every five yards. It's an outlet. And then far, far future um, from digital download, we'll move from digital download to core text upload, straight into your brain, things to look forward to. And then Google will merge with Amazon and they'll become Google's on, they'll become Skynet. And that'll be the end of the world. And <laughs> and on that happy note, I'll leave you with a few quotes. 
Woody Allen, summing up, it is clear that the future holds great opportunities. It, hold, it also holds pitfalls. The trick it will be to avoid the pitfalls, seize the opportunities, and to be back home by 6 p.m. Arthur C. Clark, check me for accuracy on December 31st, 2000, oh, 2100. Check me for accuracy at that time as well. And Isaac Asimov, who I think is still here, um, said psychiatry will be far and away the most important medical specialty in 2014. Well, I'm booking myself in um, for next year, so thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to have questions at the end. Um, I'll leave you with that quote. Um, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. All these things are happening, um, Isaac. Um, and they are happening um, at a slow pace, but they will grow in pace over the next few years, and it's well worth thinking about it. So read more science fiction. Thank you.